Good afternoon, everyone. This is Francis Collins, the NIH director, speaking to you from a very empty Wilson Hall on the NIH campus and having the opportunity uh, to introduce you for today's very special and historic <laughs> lecture. Historic in two ways. Uh, one is our speaker, who I'll introduce in a minute, uh, Jim Allison, a remarkable role model for uh, a passionate, inquisitive, innovative scientist, uh, also a Nobel Prize winner. We're also historic because we've never done it quite like this before, <laughs> with a virtual presentation uh, where Jim is at MD Anderson in Houston, and we'll be speaking to you from there because, of course, we are in the midst of what was officially a couple of hours ago declared as a pandemic, uh, COVID-19, which is, of course, spreading across the world and very much also across the United States. So uh, just a little bit of exhortation to everybody. Uh, take this moment of a virtual presentation to remind yourself of all the other things you should be doing. No handshakes, do the elbow bumps thing, wash your hands, use your sanitizer. If you're an older person, and I guess I'm talking to myself, be particularly careful about gatherings, uh, and certainly I would not recommend going on any cruise ships right now. Uh, putting that aside, let's come uh, to today. And particularly, I want to thank the staff of MD Anderson and NIH for making it possible for us to do this, which hopefully is going to go seamlessly and has never quite been done before this virtual presentation. And if people need CME for this, and you need a number, I'm about to give it to you, 24867 is the number for NIHers who know what to do with that, 24867. So uh, about the speaker, Jim Allison is the chair of the Department of Immunology. He's the Vivian L. Smith Distinguished Chair in Immunology. He's director of the Parker Institute for Cancer Research and executive director of the Immunotherapy Platform at the MD Anderson Cancer Center. Uh, he has, of course, uh, received much uh, comment and celebration for his work on immunotherapy of cancer, beginning with a very specific effort to understand T cells, uh, the first description of the T cell receptor at the protein level, the recognition of CD28 as a major co-stimulatory molecule, and then particularly his realization that CTLA-4, which everybody else thought was another stimulatory molecule, is actually opposing CD28 and therefore became a, a particularly attractive target for immunotherapy to activate the immune system when it seemed to have not done its job tracking after a, a cancer uh, cell or a cancer tumor. And that, of course, uh, over the course of time, he without... Uh, really ever letting up, was insistent, ought to lead us to something in the way of an effective therapy, and after many closed doors, ultimately found an open door at Bristol-Myers Squibb, leading to the development of checkpoint inhibitors focused on CTLA-4. Uh, and that led, of course, uh, to much recognition of the Alaska DeBakey Clinical Medical Research Award in 2015 and the Nobel Prize in 2018 in physiology or medicine, sharing with Tasuko Hanjo for their discovery of cancer therapy by inhibition, inhibition of negative immune regulation. I have to point out that here in the room with me amongst the maybe five people who are here is Steve Rosenberg, another pioneer in cancer immunotherapy. Come to hear what you have to say, Jim. So uh, you're in good company here. Um, again, the way we're going to do this is uh, Jim's going to speak. If you have questions you want to pose in the course of this, here's what you do. Uh, you send an email, and I'm giving you an email address right now, S-M-E-R-V-I-L-L-E, Smerville, S-M-E-R-V-I-L-L-E, at mdanderson.org, MD Anderson with no spaces or periods. Send your question to smerville at mdanderson.org. There is a staff person who will read those. It would be helpful if you put in the subject line that this is an NIH question for Jim Allison. And then at the end of the presentation, a staff person will convey those to Jim, and he will seek to answer them. So this is a very special moment for us indeed. I have to say one more thing about Jim. Besides the fact that he's a remarkable scientist with a determination and a passion to make the discoveries that he has done actually benefit patients and has done so in a profound way, He's also an interesting character, an iconoclast, 
uh, referred to by um, one scientist to say that Jim's lab has the feel of a pirate ship because of the way in which he has been able to inspire other people by going down a different pathway than the obvious one. If you haven't seen the movie called Breakthrough about Jim Allison, by all means, uh, look it up, seek it out. Uh, it will be something you will remember and be inspired by. And you will learn, therefore, that not only is he a scientist, he's also a musician who plays the mouth harp. And I've had the privilege of having a duet with him in a bar somewhere east of the Capitol, which was great fun. But probably more famously, he plays mouth harp from time to time with none other than Willie Nelson. So without further ado, a guy who does great science but knows how to fu have fun, uh, please help me welcome in whatever way you can over your uh, computer internet, Jim Allison, our speaker for the Wednesday afternoon lecture. Jim, it's all yours. Okay. Thank you, Thank you Francis, for that, that kind introduction. And uh, hi, Steve, uh, whoever else is, is there. This is uh, a novel experience for us both. I'm sitting in a empty room, uh, uh, giving the talk to Scott Merville, who, as you heard, will help with the uh, questions later on. And I want to apologize to my uh, many friends who I'd hope to see if I'd been able to come there. Uh, I haven't seen in a while. And uh, I miss you guys. I'll uh, hopefully be there soon. And anyway, it wasn't my fault. <laughs> and you guys are suffering from the same thing. So what I'd like to do today is, is uh, briefly review a bit about the origins of checkpoint blockade very briefly and where we are in the field and then and then uh, spend the bulk of the time talking about some recent insight that we've developed into the detailed cellular mechanisms of, of the two main checkpoints CTLA-4 and PD-1 and uh, how they differ and also some surprising results that uh, we've come across uh, about how they work in combination, which actually it turns out is not just the sum of the two, but uh, differs uh, from either alone. So uh, uh, all this came uh, from what uh, Dr. Collins told you about recognition of how T cells are regulated. Uh, but one thing that we showed in the early 1990s was that the fact that tumor cells were not very good at listing immune responses wasn't just because they didn't have antigens. Uh, it was because they couldn't provide co-stimulation. And we showed that by putting the B7 molecules, transducing them into tumor cells, a number of different experimental tumor cells, B7 being the ligands for CD28, um, provide the co-stimulatory signal. And that was sufficient to lead to tumor rejection of almost any uh, mouse tumor line that we tried. So the fact that they grow in wild-type mice does, is not because they don't have antigens, it's because they're basically invisible to the immune system because they can't provide co-stimulation. And so putting that along with what I knew about regulation of T cells, we came up with this, this model where the tumor gets a head start for the reasons I just outlined, um, but is invisible until there's some tumor cell death, perhaps because of uh, deprivation of oxygen or, or glucose or whatever. Um, the di uh, inflammatory death, antigen-presenting cells come in, phagocytize tumor bits, get it activated, uh, represent antigens in the context of B7 molecules, which initially provides co-stimulation, uh, turns on a whole activation program that says divide, divide, you know, to go from the few dozen T cells that you have of a given specificity to hun the hundreds of thousands of soldiers in the field that you need to do that within several days or a week or so. Uh, and then CTLA-4 kicks in always to shut that off. Uh, it's hardwired to stop that, expo that expansion phase of T cells. And so the reasoning was that maybe if CTLA-4 shuts off the T cells before they have a chance to fully eliminate the tumors, then the tumor wins. And we could overcome that by just simply blocking the breaks of CTLA-4 with a monoclonal antibody is shown here in the cartoon, and allowing unrestrained co-stimulation to take forth for as long as it takes uh, to get tumor elimination. And this was compelling for a couple of reasons. Uh, one was that uh, since we're treating the immune system and not the cancer cell, as long as the cancer cell has antigens, it really shouldn't matter 
Uh, this was potentially an almost universal treatment for cancer. And the second one was that uh, this could uh, take advantage, since death starts this process, uh, you could use it to enhance virtually anything, any conventional therapy that causes tumor cell death, and you could give them the benefits of an immune response, such as immunological memory and polyvalency, et cetera, um, and uh, could really do combinatorial um, treatments, therefore, and really um, do a lot besides just immunotherapy alone. And so this was one of the first experiments we did. This is a transplantable tumor growing on the backs of mice. You can see we have to euthanize them about after a little over a month. If we inject blocking antibodies to CD28, the tumor grows faster, um, indicating there is a nascent immune response, but it's not capable of eliminating the tumor. But when we injected antibodies to CTLA-4, the tumor would grow for a while and then get rejected, and the mice were permanently immune then to rechallenge. And so this was astounding when we got this result. That by covering up this single molecule, on out of all the things that are going on when the, the tumor cell is encountering the host defense is sufficient to turn you know, death to tumor rejection and long-lived immunity. The question is, would it work in humans, of course? Um, and so we worked, um, as, as Dr. Collins uh, alluded to, uh, to find a company, uh, first uh, Metarex and then Bristol-Myers Squibb, made a fully human antibody in mice that had the immunoglobulin genes replaced with human. Uh, the antibody was called ipilimumab. Um, it was active, as we would have predicted, against many tumor types in early assays. Uh, there were adverse events associated with it, a lot of itises that can be fatal, um, but they're generally manageable. Um, and um, can be treated, and, and the patients weaned off um, steroids, for example, and they don't come back. So most of these are not um, necessarily autoimmune diseases. But now that hundreds of thousands have been treated, it's very clear that there are autoimmune diseases, type 1, diabetes, and a, a myocarditis, a T-cell-mediated myocarditis, which has recently been recognized, um, which are thankfully um, occur in, in a very tiny minority, but significant minority of patients, and these are being uh, worked on. Um, but it all still works. So this is uh, a slide. This is a patient who I've come to know well, Sharon Belvin, when she was 22 years old, just out of college, just gotten engaged. She was diagnosed with metastatic melanoma. She had 31 nodules in her lungs, as you can see here. And after a single treatment, after sorry, after four treatments of NSCLA-4, those tumors went completely away. She also had a half centimeter brain metastasis, which you can see here. Um, and these had all resisted chemotherapy and radiation therapy, uh, but the brain metastasis went away as well. That was 2004. There's a photograph she sent me in 2016 showing her with her two babies. Um, and now they're, they're teenagers. Um, it's now been 16 years uh, since the intervention, and, and everybody's still doing fine. So that's the potential of, of checkpoint blockade in a disease which was untreatable uh, before then. So this led to a phase three clinical trial as shown here um, that was a randomized trial of about 800 patients. Uh, placebo control here, which, which was uh, not unreasonable because there was no standard of care for melanoma at the time. Um, and the anacetyl 4 ipilimumab moved the survival over several months indicating uh, that would have been enough for FDA approval, which it was approved in 2011. But this was an overall survival trial. And what can be seen is that the, the survival curve flattens out in about two to three years at about 20% and stayed there for the duration of the trial. This was followed up a few years ago uh, by a retrospective study of several thousand patients. And it was shown again uh, that this flattens out at about 20%, a little over 20%, and stays there for as long as 10 years. And there is one patient that I know of that's 19 years out who was in the first phase one trial. And so it's a very durable response, and I think these patients can be considered cured at that point. Um, but why 20%? You know, that was a big advance, but it's really not enough, and why isn't it more? Well, there's some mechanistic problems, uh, issues. Uh, the drug probably needs to be on board when priming is occurring um, and uh, other things that I could cite. But the more interesting um, 
issue, of course, is that maybe there are other checkpoints. And um, Tasku Hanjo discovered a molecule called PD-1, which in 2001, working with Gordon Freeman and Arlene Sharp, was shown to have two um, uh, counter receptors, PD ligand 1 and ligand 2, uh, and was another checkpoint. It differs from CTLA-4 in a number of, re, uh, of uh, ways, but one of them is that the ligand of PD-1, PD-L1, is induced on tumor cells by gamma interferon, um, and then this inter, um, interacts with PD-1 on the T cell, interferes with their function and proliferation. So this is an acquired resistance mechanism, so not a fundamental part of an immune response as CTLA-4 is. And so very quickly, antibodies to PD-1 were developed. This just shows a summary of the phase one trial conducted by Suzanne Tapalian with good responses in melanoma, non-small cell lung cancer, and renal cancer. There were no responses in colorectal cancer, although we know now that a subset of colorectal cancer with defects in DNA damage repair responds quite well. And there were no responses in, in castrate-resistant prostate cancer. But uh, with Pam Sharma here at the um, immunotherapy platform at MD Anderson, we've recently worked out why that is and developed a combination therapy that we think will be quite effective against that. Um, these are independent, as indicated by the fact that patients that progress on, on ipilimumab uh, can be treated with nivolumab successfully or at a PD-1, and vice versa, patients that fail PD-1 can be successfully treated with anti-CTLA-4, which raised the possibility of putting them together since they're mechanistically different. And so Mike Curran, when he was a postdoc in the lab, showed that in animal models, uh, combining these agents was at least additive. Um, and then this led Jed Walchuk uh, to conduct uh, a series of phase of, of trials with a combination of, of ipilimumab with nivolumab and acetyl 4 plus PD-1. Shown here, um, 18 month um, uh, or 15 months actually, and there was about a 55 uh, month, 55 percent survival in this combination. But this data has recently reached the five year point, and it's still above 50 percent. So this again is a very durable response, and I think there's no reason to think. And in five more years, we're not going to see um, a 10 year survival um, approaching, again, 50 to 55 percent. Um, we'll have to wait and see, but it's uh, um, quite a ways to go since from a disease that had a median life expectancy of about seven months after diagnosis when this work was started. And so, this, of course, has led to an explosion of work uh, with approvals, mostly of PD 1 antibodies. Um, are combinations with anti-CTLA-4, not just in melanoma, but lung cancer, renal cancer, colorectal carcinoma, the other kinds of cancer you can see here, including one approval of PD-1 antibody for any patient with any kind of cancer that has defects in DNA damage, and because of the frequency of neoantigens is likely to respond uh, to treatment um, with uh, PD-1 checkpoint blockade. The first, as far as I know, of approval by the FDA of a drug for defects um, in, in, in DNA repair um, just across all tumor types. Um, in any event, uh, there's a lot of been going on, but there's been a tendency to think of these as just two different checkpoints uh, indiscriminately, and they're, 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 they're really not. They're very different. As I mentioned, CTLA-4 seems to be hardwired. Uh, is involved in stopping the proliferative phase of T cells after activation, regardless of what stimulates the immune response. Whereas PD-1 is an induced resistance that probably originally existed to protect the developing fetus from destruction by the maternal immune response to paternally encoded antigens, and tumors um, co-opted that to protect themselves. CTLA-4 seems to uh, target the CD28 pathway, although there's a a little bit of controversy about that. And PD-1, the T-cell receptor pathway, although there's even more controversy about that. But on balance, I think most of the data is consistent with that differentiation. CTLA-4, as I showed you in the cartoon, seems to work uh, during T-cell priming, whereas PD-1 works on terminally differentiated effector T-cells, not during priming. There may be minor effects, but the bulk effects, as I'll show you in a moment, are on fully differentiated cells. Because it works different uh, during priming, 
It's been shown that C-24 blockade regularly enhances clonal diversity by recruiting new clones, whereas PD-1 seems to just expand the clones that have already been um, induced against a tumor response. Um, C-24 responses are often very slow, whereas PD-1 are usually rapid. As I'll show you in a moment, C-24 blockade primarily affects CD4 T cells, but can also affect CD8s, whereas PD-1, um, at least as monotherapy, affects only CD8 T cells. We found that at least in, in um, prostate cancer and kidney cancer, which are normally pretty cold, C T L A four blockade can move T cells into a cold tumor, whereas P D one cannot. Adverse events associated with P D one are relatively frequent, uh, which is why it's used more, and much less frequent than, than P D one. Um, but also disease recurrence after responses to C T L A four are quite rare and and are quite significant after P D one, about twenty-five percent or so at about two years in, in, in melanoma. And not shown here is the way that they're given. CTLA-4 is usually given as four doses, up to four doses at three-week intervals, and then stopped. Whereas PD-1, depending on the manufacturer, there's uh, several out, out there, um, is usually given until progression or for as long as two years, and for reasons that will become apparent in, in, in a moment. So we wanted to really try to, uh, we meaning Spencer Way, a postdoc in the lab, wanted to get some insight into these mechanisms uh, by using mass cytometry, high-parameter uh, um, um, Cytoff analysis. Uh, and in our panel, we used uh, uh, surface markers and antibodies to T-cell uh, transcription factors, uh, important in determining lineage commitment, but also uh, surface markers representing all the different stages that we could cram into the panel. Also, markers for cell viability, for cell proliferation uh, um, and cell death, as well as barcoding so that we could co-analyze all the samples together for more accuracy and, um, and deconvolute them. And so we did this in MC38, which is a colorectal tumor that has a really large mutational burden and responds very well to both PD-1 and CTLA-4 therapy. We also did this analysis with B16 uh, the B16 melanoma, which is very poorly immunogenic uh, and doesn't respond to either antibody unless you use uh, an irradiated tumor cell vaccine, in our case expressing GMCSF with it. But we got the, essentially the same results in both cases, so it really doesn't seem to matter what the tumor is, whether it's high mutational load or low, and whether you use uh, a vaccine or not. You get the same answer. So the idea was to give the mice tumors and then harvest them at about day 13 when they're starting to shrink. Now this shows a dot plot here. Um, we're gating here on CD45 and CD3 epsilon so that we catch all T cells. And the blue dots show uh, what we get in the analysis of the Tisney plot um, from con isotype control. The red dots are anacetylase 4 and the green dots PD-1. So the first thing you can see, if you look down here in the NKT cell, gamma delta cell area, is that they're essentially random. Um, there's really no difference. Now, when you look up here in the Treg, the FOXP3 positive CD4 area, you see a paucity of CD4 of, of CTLA4 dots. This is because CTLA4 in the mouse depletes Treg cells. It does not do this um, in humans because of a difference. Um, and the FC receptor of the of the ipilimumab antibody does not support FC gamma receptor binding or antibody dependent cell mediated cytotoxicity, which is the mechanism of Treg depletion in mice. But again, that does not happen in humans, so far as we can tell. Looking pretty extensively in bladder, prostate, um, and kidney cancer, are from Tony Rebus looking very extensively in melanoma. But what you can see here that happens in mice and in humans is a big increase in, in, in CD4 cells, effector cells, uh, with CTLA-4, much less so with PD-1, or isotype. And here in the CD8, you can see pockets of, of red from CTLA-4 and of green from CD8. So both uh, those antibodies have effects on different types of CD8 T cells. 
And so to visualize what those types are, I'll show you here the phenogram, where these are the different, the 15 different clusters we detected, and these show the individual um, heat maps of the individual markers that we're looking at shown here. So obviously this is um, uh, headache inducing if you try to draw anything from that. So we've organized this here to make it more understandable. And again, uh, what we did though, uh, we measured the weight of the tumor from each mouse individually and kept track of that so that we could associate um, the numbers of each cell type, each cluster type, with a change in tumor size. And so there was nothing in the NKT cells that associated with tumor size at all. Um, so all the action is in the C4, CD4 and CD8 T cells. Um, and so as I stated, you can see depletion. There's two types of FOXP3 positive CD4 cells, one that's KLRG1 positive, the other one's KLRG1 negative. The majority of these are KLRG1 positive. You can see those are considerably decreased by acetylate 4 These also look like they're depleted a little bit by acetylate 4 So I'll show you in a moment that both of those, the more of those cells they are, the bigger the tumor is, as you might expect from an inhibitory cell. There were two clusters of CD4 cells in these analyses. This one you can see is obviously radically increased by acetylate 4 and not by PD-1. Uh, this is an ICOS, uh, this is a Th1-like cell. It has Tbet. We know from other experiments that it, these cells make gamma interferon and TNF-alpha. It also expresses PD-1, uh, indicating it's a Th1 cell, and expresses intermediate levels of ICOS. And I'll come back to this in a moment because that's a very uh, unusual phenotype for a CD4 cell. And that is strongly associated with smaller tumor size. The other cells look like Th zeros, undifferentiated um, CD4 cells, and they really don't have any effect on tumor size at all. Um, in the CD8 compartment, what you can see is this population is also increased by CTLA4. Um, this is a PD1 intermediate, meaning it's an activated cell. It's Tbet positive, uh, and these are, are um, KLRG1 positive. So these are um, terminally differentiated effector CD8-like T cells. Um, and then there's two other, and these are associated with smaller tumor size. Um, there's two other populations um, of, of T cells that look like they're partially activated that are increased by CTLA-4. Um, this one doesn't have any effect on tumor size. This one has a slight effect, inhibitory effect, probably because they're getting in the way of these others. Uh, PD-1, on the other hand, increases nothing in the CD4 compartment. Um, it doesn't really do anything to the CD to the Tregs. This is probably due to dilu dilution uh, by expansion of the CD8s. But PD-1 enhances these CD8 effector cells, just as CTLA-4 does, but also uniquely uh, increases proliferation of a cell that's, that's also um, Tbet positive, um, uh, looks like a CD8 cytotoxic cell, but has very high levels of PD-1, TIM3, and LAG3, a third inhibitory molecule. And these cells are the ones that are terminally exhausted, phenotypically look like they're terminally exhausted, um, which others have shown are the main cells that are detected when you treat either mice or humans with PD-1. Um, the interesting thing is we know these cells are proliferating because of um, the DR markers that we had in them. Um, and so they are proliferating while the antibodies are around, but they still have this PD-1 high, TIM3 high, LAG3 high phenotype. And so that tells us that when the antibody goes away, they're going to stop proliferating again. And they probably, um, there's been shown by John Huary and others um, uh, that uh, these cells have epigenetic changes that seem to perhaps lock them in that phenotype so they can't go back. So as long as you have the antibody around, they will proliferate. But again, when you take it away, they haven't phenotypically changed, so they're going to stop proliferating again. And so we think that may be why uh, you have to continue giving uh, PD-1 for such long periods of time. And just to show you the size data, this is the KLRG1, Tregs, again, bigger, more cells, bigger tumors in both cases. Um, the Th1-like metacluster of CH4, these ICOS-positive cells associated with smaller tumors, 
The other ones, the TH zeros, no change. Um, and the CD8s, these are the exhausted cells, the fully exhausted cells, PD1, TIM3, LAG3 high. You see they're clearly associated with smaller tumor cells. These are the, you might call them partially exhausted, PD1 high, TIM3 low, LAG3 negative actually. These are more like effector cells. And then these cells um, don't really, have, those cells both have uh, associated with tumor shrinkage. These don't do much of anything. These may look like passers-by, may actually get in the way of treatment. So just to summarize these then, um, they're overlapping but quite distinct cellular mechanisms of these two treatments as monotherapy. Again, both c 4 and PD-1 expand these CD8 effector cells. Uh, c 4 also, sorry, these CD8 effector cells, c 4 also expands these Th1-like ICOS positive cells. PD-1 doesn't, but PD-1 also expands these exhausted um, uh, triple positive PD-1 lag, lag 2, sorry, TIP3 cells. Um, so they look quite different. Now, before going on to the combination, I want to talk a little bit about these ICOS positive cells because if you mention to an immunologist that you're looking at a CD4 cell that express ICOS, um, they'll tell you, well, that's either a follicular T helper cell, which are found in lymph nodes in the germinal centers associated with B cells. Um, these are cells that produce type 2 cytokines that are involved in immun immunoglobulin class switching and really wouldn't do you any good in a tumor at all. Or there is a subset the FOXP3 positive regulatory T cells that make IL-10 that express high levels of ICOS um, that also would be counterproductive in a tumor. Um, and again, ICOS is a member of the same family as CD28, c 4 and ultimately PD-1, although it has its own ligand. Um, however, the first role of these cells in cancer was shown by Pat Sharma in a pre-surgical uh, sur uh, trial that she did uh, with anacetylate 4 in bladder cancer in 2006. And just to summarize that work, what Pam found was that after treatment of patients, um, she did bladder cancer. We've since found this in not, not only bladder cancer, but also prostate cancer, um, uh, kidney cancer, and melanoma. Any patient that gets anacetylate 4 will show these ICOS positive cells in the tumor and in the blood only after treatment with anacetylate 4 and with IPI. Um, this population, if you sort them, contains all of the tumor-specific CD4s that make gamma interferon and TNF-alpha. So all of the functional tumor-specific cytokine-producing CD4s um, are in that population, that icos positive population. When I was at Sloan Kettering uh, working with Jed Walchuk, um, look, using his samples from the phase three trial of ipilimumab, what we showed was that the patients who have sustained increase in CD4 cells tended to have uh, survivals in excess of 22 months, but those that didn't upregulate these cells during the entire course of therapy had survivals averaging about eight months. So the increase of these cells was associated uh, with longer survival, suggesting a role in um, effect. Anyway, it's at least a pharmacodynamic marker of ipilimumab activity, that it's hit its target. But what I'll show you in a moment is that we found in mouse studies with PAMS lab that um, ICOS is really essential for optimal e efficacy of CTLA-4 blockade, and it probably does this by binding PI3 kinase and signaling through the AKT pathway, which elevates T-bed expression, uh, makes the cells more TH1-like and enhances cytokine production. And we've shown in other work that this could be targeted uh, independently to increase the efficacy of CTLA-4. But the important point is that is this, and if you treat wild-type mice, this is the B16 tumor plus uh, cellular irradiated, irradiated cellular vaccine, expressing GVAX, you can obtain cures at about 85% of mice. But if you do that same experiment, exactly the same, except an ICOS or ICOS ligand, knockout mice, you lose over half the efficacy. So um, CTLA-4 is required, sorry, ICOS is required for optimal efficacy of CTLA-4 therapy. So this, this is uh, 
as, as a very important observation that I'll come back to in a minute. But before I get to the therapeutic effects then, this caused us to really look carefully uh, at, at where we could find these cells. And I can tell you that using that panel that we used at Cytoff, we could not find an equivalent population anywhere in mice, in the lymph nodes or spleen or bone marrow or thymus. We could not find, at the level of detection of about a half percent, we could not find CD4 positive, TBET positive cells. And in patients not treated with NICTLA4, we could not find ICOS positive, TBET positive CD4s in peripheral blood lymphocytes. And so we then decided to address the possibility that negative co-stimulation via CTLA-4 might be affecting T-cell differentiation by essentially just repeating this sort of analysis um, that we've done where we remove NICTLA-4 with antibodies, both in humans and mice, we saw the same thing, but where we genetically remove CTLA-4 in knockout mice. And so we looked at this, again, this exactly the same panel, I'm doing cluster analysis, and I'm going to introduce archetype analysis later on in, the, in this discussion, which is a different way of looking at the same data. But this is what we get, and this is uh, what you see in, in um, red or, uh, sorry, green or blue, what you see either in wild type or litter mate heterozygous mice when you use this panel. When you look at CTLA-4 knockout mice, you get what's shown in red. So you see these patches here, but look at this guy down here. This looks like Australia. It's way down there south. No connections. It's a different continent. Not connected with those other populations at all. And things look very much different down there, just as um, my Australian friends, much like Texans, say Australia is different. Because that contains these populations, this one, this one, this one, sorry, these four, this one, this one, this one, and this one, that are not found at all, as we can tell, in heterozygous or uh, wild-type mice. So these are these ICOS-positive uh, CD4 cells um, that are TBET positive. All of these are CD4s. We also see this aberrant FOXP3 cell here, as well as this unusual cell um, that has the OMI's um, CD62 ligand, lacks CD44, has got a three. And then this very strange population here uh, that has BCL6, got a three, and ROR gamma T, three master cytokines um, that should be lineage determining. And so for those that are not immunologists, what we know about CD4 cells is they exit the thymus um, committed with a with their T cell receptor fully formed, uh, knowing that they're going to be CD4 cells. When they encounter uh, antigen in the, in the class of in the in the context of class two MHC on dendritic cells, depending on what's going on, the kind of cytokines that are around, and directly on the kind of which stat pathway, Jack stat pathway is activated, they end up with a matched transcription factor factor which determines their function. BCL6, for example, is associated with follicular T helper cells, GATA3 with TH2s, TBET with TH1s, RO gamma T with TH17s, and FOXP3 uh, with, with Treg cells. And so as I showed you, we have this one cell that we found that has all, has, uh, all of has these three, this one, this one, and this one. So this suggests a bit of confusion at this monolithic view of differentiation may not be quite correct. But anyway, before I get into that, um, what I want to do is show you, there's another way of looking at Cytoff data when instead of clustering things just according to how similar they are, you start with what you think may be an originating cell, like a TH0, and then you start mathematically going away from that um, and seeing what you go through on the way to the final stage, like these ICOS positive cells. Um, so you can tell, this is not real data, it's just a, showing the difference. You can tell the difference between just a graft distance and a Euclidean distance, sorry, graft distance where cells um, are going through differentiation stages rather than just a graft distance that might suggest that's the shortest way. Um, so 
If we then do that sort of analysis and look at archetypes, this is Australia here again. And what you can see is that cluster seven uh, archetypes is these uh, comp is, is the cells, this ICOS positive T Tbet cells, the exact same ones that we get when we treat mice or humans with anti uh, CGLA4 antibodies. And these others look like intermediates of other cells. But again, these are very different cells which arise in the absence of CTLA-4 uh, presence during co-stimulation. And so where, so um, the question is, where do those come from? Well, it could be an alteration in thymic development, but we looked at, at every aspect of the thymus and these knockouts that we could, including not only the different differentiation states, but also even the repertoire. And there's nothing different about the repertoire or anything about thymic differentiation uh, in CTLA-4 knockout mice. The T cells come out. Uh, exactly the same. It's not that one cell has an enhanced proliferation or activation. We have the markers um, in the panel to test those. So we think what it is is deregulation of the phenotypic constraints. In other words, normally T cells are allowed only a certain amount of space in which they can differentiate. But if you take CTLA-4 away, or, or PD-1 potentially, they have additional differentiative space which they could occupy representing cells that aren't necessarily found in nature. And so with CTLA-4, what we think is going on, since it works at priming, is that by removing uh, CD28 from the signaling that goes on during the earliest stages of priming, um, what CTLA-4 might be doing is effectively increasing the strength of T-cell receptor signaling. Another way of saying that is one of the functions that many people have thought about for CTLA-4 over the years is that it decreases the signal that's necessary to get a naive T cell activated as a result of tonic uh, signaling, which a T cell gets all the time because they're selected to have some affinity for self-MHC. And we think that CTLA-4's job is to constrain that, attenuate that signal. And in the absence of CTLA-4, that signal is much stronger. Now, there's a, rep, there's a precedent for this in Th1 T-cell differentiation. Kim Bottomley showed uh, in the late 1970s uh, that T-cells that get CD4 T-cells that have stronger peptide MHC signals during their initial encounter um, with antigen uh, tend to go down the Th1 pep, uh, pathway. Uh, and so we think that this is just an exaggeration of that. By taking CTLA-4 away, uh, that gives more access to co-stimulation, uh, sorry, less access to co-stimulation, um, which then, uh, sorry, again, more access to co-stimulation when you take it away, which gives supernatural TCR signals, which then allows T cells to have uh, these new spaces into which they can differentiate. And if that's, hence you get from uh, antibody removal of CTLA-4, you get this new phenotype, uh, functional phenotype of cells that didn't exist in the presence of CTLA-4. Um, and so uh, that suggests then a more nuanced, uh, plastic, flexible model of T-cell differentiation as has been originally suggested by John O'Shea and the late Bill Paul there at the NIH uh, to happen during CD4 uh, differentiation from TH0 cells. And I don't have time to show you the data, but if we track the markers on those, on those uh, ICOS positive TH1 cells, they initially start with BCL6, GATA3, and TBET, and gradually lose BCL6 and GATA3, ending up just with TBET um, in their mature state. Um, after antibody treatment. And we think that similarly, those other cells that we're observing, like the one with um, BCL6, uh, GATA3, and ROR gamma T, may be similar intermediates um, that we don't normally see uh, because they're constrained uh, by CTLA-4. In any event, when we look at this, look at the CD8 cells, we see difference in the different clusters uh, when we look at CD8s and CTLA-4 knockout mice, but we don't see anything that's not present uh, in, in the wild-type animals. And similarly, when we look at PD-1 knockout mice, we don't see any differences in either CD4 or CD8 archetypes uh, that aren't there at some level 
um, in either the, the wild type or the, or the heterozygote. So um, this phenomena so far seems to be uh, unique to the effects of CTLA-4 on priming. Um, and it makes sense that PD-1 didn't do that since it seems to operate on T cells only on, on, on fully differentiated, differentiated T cells with effector function. So again, just to summarize this part of the talk, we think that this analysis has, has provides support for the nuanced model of T cell differentiation championed by, by um, John O'Shea and, and Bill Paul uh, in the past. It's not a novel finding for us at all. But it suggested that when you are considering cells that you look at uh, that are expanded and can be associated with anti-tumor activity, when you block PD-1 and CTLA-4, looks like with PD-1 you're mostly expanding cells that were previously there, and in CTLA-4 it looks like the drug is creating the cell that itself then goes out and carries out uh, the, the anti-tumor effect of the treatment. Okay. So then the last thing I'd like to deal with is, is how do these mechanisms interact? As I told you, is that uh, CTLA-4 and PD-1, uh, when you give them together, equal uh, the sum of the two, or is it somehow different? And so again, we did exactly the same analysis that I showed you before, except we added this fourth group, which is the combination therapy, and otherwise the analysis is the same. And I'll just cut to the chase and show you, again, with monotherapy, with PD-1, these are the exhausted cells, the PD-1, LAG-3, TIM-3, expanded only by PD-1 and not by CTLA-4. When you add CTLA-4, those cells decrease in number, essentially, to control levels or even below. So they really decrease a lot. And as I'll show you in a moment, they also become irrelevant to the anti-tumor process itself. However, when you look at these terminally differentiated activated cells that have low levels of PD-1 and low levels of TIM-3, um, you can see um, those are expanded by CTLA-4, a little bit by PD-1, but when you put them together, they expand a lot more than, than either one um, by itself. Either one alone, sorry. So you lose these, you increase these to even higher levels, uh, and then, again, these exhausted cells, which before were strongly correlated with decrease in tumor size, become irrelevant uh, when you give the combination therapy. Um, so the CD4 ICOS positive cells, however, are expanded when you uh, treat with PD-1 above what you get with CTLA-4. And we think because they're generated by removing the constraints of CTLA-4 um, while they're being generated, but they are express PD-1 because they're activated, so it's constraining their proliferation. So when you give PD-1 as well, they expand even more. And so PD-1 adds to the punch, the anti-tumor punch from, from those cells. And so, again, you've gone from an effector cell, a CD4 cell, an effector CD8 cell expanded by CTLA-4 blockade, an effector cell, uh, CD8 cell, and an exhausted cell expanded by PD-1, both of which are involved in the anti-tumor effect, to in the combination therapy, this is reduced to the only cells that matter are the CD4 ICOS TH1-like cells, and there are a lot more of them than in monotherapy, and these effector cells. Um, and again, the presence of both agents, there are more of those than there are in any monotherapy at all. And so that then raises the question of, of what happened to those exhausted cells. So there's two possibilities. One of them is that they're converted back into the effector cells. Uh, this may seem to be um, unlikely because uh, there are epigenetic changes that are involved in generating those cells. Um, um, this is felt it, it may be unlikely, um, but... Uh, um, Andrea Schettinger at Sloan Kettering uh, suggested that maybe they're not completely fixed, but uh, we'll, we'll see. What we're trying to do now is uh, look at these cells and examine them for any of the marks, epigenetic marks that may be associated with the 
uh, exhausted cells, but they're still left after the combination therapy. Uh, but another interesting idea is that maybe when you have continued co-stimulation that's allowed by the absence of c 4 again, this continued co-stimulation, maybe that can actually present the, prevent the cells ever, the CD8 cells ever going in to the exhausted state. And so they can be prevented from being exhausted and just expanded by the ex, um, presence of anti-PD-1. And so this remains to be determined, but may have impact on the way we think about combining these antibodies and the dose schedules that we use with the combination as opposed to the monotherapies. And so um, just to finish, there are a lot more molecules now that are under investigation, several of which, but not all, are shown on, on this cartoon, a lot more inhibitory molecules um, that have been shown to be potential targets in immunotherapy. And so in the future, we're going to see a lot more combinations. I personally believe that the backbone of, of all immunotherapies is going to be the combination of CTLA-4 and PD-1 for the reasons I've shown you, uh, combined with other negative as well as positive co-stimulators such as ICOS. Uh, these can be used, as I mentioned earlier, with both conventional therapies, chemotherapy and radiation, and there's increasing activity being based on looking at um, the combination with genomically targeted therapies where, where they work in order to obtain uh, real cures. And so I'll just finish by showing um, something that I like to point out is that up until the last several years, the uh, conventional way of doing can uh, cancer therapy is to treat thousands of patients with a drug, look for a statistically significant increase in median survival to evaluate its efficacy. But we know since ipilimumab that you can do that, but you can also get a very durable tail on the survival curve of a decade or more, that, um, at least a decade or more. Um, and this is a data, 55% uh, would be the data where we are with, with uh, ipinevo and melanoma, but this is just uh, aspirational uh, results that we'd like to see uh, by doing the proper combinations with uh, uh, and as many different kinds of cancer as we can. Uh, to, to really achieve uh, cures uh, across the board. Uh, and as I showed you earlier, we've done a lot of many types of cancer. Uh, so far, not that much in some cancers like glioblastoma and pancreatic, although there are glints of success now. And with diligence, so we know this can be done, and with diligence and rational uh, use of data obtained from, mice, uh, from patients treated with these agents, I think we'll be able to come up with curative combinations. And so with that, I'll stop and, and take questions. Um, if uh, we have some. And thank you for your attention where, wherever you are out there. <clears throat> so one patient asked, if you got TB and got cured, are you more vulnerable to coronavirus than a regular healthy patient? I don't feel that I'm qualified to, to deal with that. Uh, perhaps uh, Dr. Fauci might help you with that, but I think uh, the usual precautions are, uh, are probably uh, desirable. Second question is, uh, clinical observations show patients receiving antibiotics uh, could hardly benefit from anti-PD-1 treatments. However, it's necessary for some to take antibiotics. What is the current guideline to apply antibiotics when patients are undergoing anti-PD-1 treatment? It's a very good question because um, of, of the current work showing that the microbiome is very important uh, to the outcome of these therapies. And it, it has been shown, <coughs> excuse me, in patients that receive antibiotics for infections that, that their therapeutic effect, excuse me, might be somewhat impaired. So I think that the, the clinical advice is to be very diligent and not give the, not give antibiotics to patients unless they're absolutely necessary to really you know not use it frivolously unless you know a patient can benefit uh, what are my thoughts on the potential increase in autoimmune events due to deregulated T cell differentiation by anti c 4 antibodies um, I think it's a real problem um, as I mentioned, uh, there are a lot of itises, a lot of inflammatory conditions that occur. Most of the adverse events are of that sort that can be reversed 
with systemic steroids, uh, usually they occur late enough where the steroids don't, ne don't necessarily interfere with the antitherapeutic effect um, if they're given late enough. But as I mentioned, it is clear now that there's certain patients that develop type 1 diabetes. Now, whether these patients previously had subclinical disease uh, isn't, isn't really clear. Um, there is also a, a fraction of patients, I don't know what the real number is, somewhere around 1%, although it may be slightly higher, that developed a T-cell-mediated myocarditis. Um, this is something that we have uh, seen in uh, an animal model that we've recently developed, and this is a very real um, uh, effect. And I think that it's something that we have to be conscious of and uh, develop strategies for dealing with and detecting early um, the, the problem is that, uh, that many times the patients don't report them, or the physicians may not become aware of the adverse events until uh, uh, the, disease, the treatment has to be terminated. But I think uh, with careful attention, attention to the patients, uh, many physicians have been able to detect these early enough to intervene and really, really stop them. I think that's the key thing is education of the, of the physicians. Uh, and experience to develop the necessary algorithms. Another question is, what are my thoughts on the potential increase in auto, um, autoimmune dementia? Well, I'm oh, sorry, I already read that one. The, the, the next one is, um, checkpoint inhibitors don't always work, even for melanoma. In initiating therapy, does your research point to human tumor biomarkers besides DNA repair that might predict responsiveness to anti-CTLA-4 and anti-PD-1? I can tell you that pretreatment, so far as I know, there isn't anything that, that's good enough to really make a decision on treatment or not uh, on baseline samples. However, there are signatures that we know now um, that occur soon after treatment that can tell you whether to continue treatment or to move on to another treatment or a combination treatment. But as of yet, uh, we're not so good at presenting, predicting from a baseline sample who's going um, to respond. Uh, so that's all I have so far. Do you want to, one, one more is coming. Uh, this obviously has been, looking for a signature has obviously been a matter of, of considerable attention. And for a while it was thought that that baseline levels of PDL1 might be productive, and that has been partially predictive in some kinds of cancer, such as uh, melanoma, but in others, such as kidney cancer, for example, it's not useful at all. And it's certainly not useful when you're going to treat pa patients with a combination of anti-CTLA-4 and anti-PD-1, because we know that CTLA-4 treatment itself induces PDL1 expression uh, in the tumor cells. Question: Can I make slides available? Uh, yes, yes, I'd, I'd be happy. I'd be happy to. Um, someone wants to contact us. The other question is: Does ICOS positive CD TBET positive CD4 T cells exist in other conditions such as autoimmunity? And is this activation due to chronic activation of T cells? They, I have seen that they've been reported in other conditions. Um, of its, in its existence of these cells solely dependent on blocking CKLA4. Um, I'd have to say right now, under the usual conditions, I would say that they are dependent on blocking CKLA-4. Uh, in patients that develop autoimmunity from the, the uh, checkpoint blockade, um, those cells do seem to be, where CD4 T cells are involved, they are of the ICOS uh, positive type. Uh, but I can't rule out that there might be other biological conditions, chronic infection or uh, really strong uh, virus, uh, chronic virus, or, or strong virus infections that may lead to their production. But uh, I can't rule any of those out. Um, and last question, can you please talk about differences between anti-PD-1 and anti-CTLA-4, which I think I, I have uh, for the entire talk. I don't know uh, what else I could say about that, except they are different but complementary. And uh, which is why I think that in the future, uh, by titrating CTLA-4 down, uh, dialing it down to avoid and minimize adverse events, I think that we're going to see the maximum uh, clinical impact from the two of them for the reasons that I've described. 
was a long one and I couldn't, they couldn't get it written down. <laughs> Okay, I'll try this one. Uh, using different flavors of CRISPR systemic delivery, it might be possible to directly target somatic mutations in oncogenes such as KRAS, uh, et cetera, by inserting uh, sequence coding for peptides known to trigger immune responses due to previous routine childhood and or adolescence vaccination. Due to multiple challenges in most tumor types, not more than 10 to 15 percent, but presumably, but probably, properly express immunogenic peptides at a single time point. In opinion, my opinion, would such an approach have a chance of achieving clinically relevant efficacy? Um, I, uh, I'd have to think about that for a minute. I, th I think that it probably could, but obviously uh, the potential dangers in something like that are, are, are pretty severe, and it would take, take a, um, a lot of um, consideration before actually doing that in, in people. People have done this. Tyler Jacks has done something very similar in a mouse model by coupling, uh, uh, by putting uh, chicken ovalbumin in a construct that has KRAS, and when he turns it on, it makes an antigen that, that the T cells can attack. So, in principle, that's been shown, um, but in people, I don't, I'm not so sure. You'd have to know what oncogene was later going to be important. So. I'll stop there. Well, Dr. Jim, Powell. this has been fantastic. Uh, this is Francis again back at NIH. Uh, we've all been wrapped uh, listening to your presentation, which went deeply into immunology in ways that uh, probably others besides me got more of the details correct than, than I did. But it was really interesting to see the steps you've taken. Let me ask one other person to come up and say thank you, because I uh, just thought it would be nice since we're doing this rather historically. Steve Rosenberg's been listening to this the whole way as well. So, yeah, Steve, anything you want to say by way of thanks? Oh, hi, Steve. <laughs> so, Jim, I always learn something when I, uh, when I hear you talk, and I learned a lot today. So not only congratulations on your marvelous uh, achievements already that are having such great impact, but the fact that you just keep, keep going and keep learning and keep teaching us. So uh, there's sometimes a tendency in some investigators when they get a lot of recognition to stop their work. For you, it just seems to have been a stimulus to work even uh, harder and more. So congratulations, and uh, we look forward to, uh, to all of the advances that I'm sure will be coming as we look at additional checkpoint modulators that get added to the two that, you, uh, that you've looked at. So thank you so much for this wonderful summary and all of your wonderful work. Indeed, bravo. Well, thank you. I wish I what, hadn't been able to come by and say hello in person. Well, usually at the end of all of these, we adjourn to the medical library and we have coffee and cookies, but I'm afraid they're going to be a bit virtual today. So I hope everybody who's listening has some way uh, to find a little bit of refreshment. Sorry that we can't do it in the context of having more conversation with you, Jim. But thank you for being willing to be our first, uh, first ever historic presentation at a Wednesday afternoon lecture in a virtual way. And I look forward when this uh, crazy pandemic ultimately comes to a close, which it will, but we don't know when, uh, to having you come back here again and teach us about some more science and maybe we could go off in a bar again and play some music. So many thanks. <laughs> really appreciate it. Wonderful presentation. Thank you, everybody who's listened. Again, um, we may have be doing more of these since this seems to be a pretty functional way to get really wonderful science in front of lots of people. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. <laughs>